If you're a kid that would like to go to children's church and your parents think it's a wonderful thing for you to do that, um, it is your time to go downstairs and we'll have some teachers there um, that will have a good time talking God's word with our young people. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up just a few days away now. And uh, maybe you will gather around the dinner table with relatives that you haven't seen in a long time. And sometimes when those situations happen, conversations with a wide variety of people take interesting turns. Maybe your uncle starts talking about politics. And as you well know by his posts on Facebook, he's not in the same political party as you are. And then your aunt starts commenting on what she thinks of the current president. But then your cousin responds with a comment about what they think about the last president. Then they bring up their airtight plan for gun control. And as you guessed, arguing ensues. But don't worry. Cooler heads convince everyone that it's not the good time on Thanksgiving dinner to talk about politics. So your grandmother decides to share parenting advice <laughs> on raising your kids the right way. Then your great aunt wants to know why your brother isn't married yet. Hmm. After a few more comments from another relative about the changes they would make to your recipe for the casserole that you brought, you're about done with ever having Thanksgiving dinner with these people. In fact, you wonder how you're even related to them. And you're eager for the awkward silence that no doubt will happen for the rest of that meal. Well, I hope your Thanksgiving isn't like that. But one thing is very sure. Your words, and words in general, they matter. This is significant to consider because we are all, all of us in here, we're substantial communicators. We communicate a lot because we're made in the image of God. And our God, he's a relational God. Have you seen the Bible that maybe many of you have with you? There's, it's pretty big. There's a lot God wanted to tell you. And he has a lot to tell you about how to communicate with those around you. And so as we're going to see in this week's chapter of James, God really, really cares about communication. So if you haven't already, turn in your Bible to James 3. James chapter 3. There are a few Bibles scattered around the chairs as well, if you didn't bring one with you. It's worth following along today on your, in your Bible or on a Bible app because we'll keep referencing this chapter as we go along together. You know, it's been a couple weeks since we last studied James together. Although last week we heard from our friends at Piercing Word, um, the entire book of James said from memory. Wasn't that good? That was good for us to hear. But let's do a quick uh, review, a quick James review. James is the author here, and you might remember from some of Pastor Jason's previous sermons that he's the brother of Jesus. But now he's a church leader, and he's writing primarily to believers, followers of Jesus. And James, he hits a lot of topics. Maybe as you were listening to Piercing Word last week as they recited the whole five chapters of James, you thought, man, James goes from one place to another almost like without warning. And if you're thinking that, you're sort of right. You know, in, in chapter 1, James talks about the times when your faith is tested. Then he goes on to say what true religion really looks like. And then chapter 2, he goes from that to talking about partiality and discrimination. But if you boil James down to a main theme, he just might be trying to get across this idea. He's saying believers be doers of the word not just hearers. Don't just sit and take it in, but actually live it out. He mentions this idea of being doers in chapter 1, and then James builds on that at the end of chapter 2 with a discussion of faith without good works. If you say you have faith, but your faith isn't leading you to do good, then your faith isn't real. It's dead, James says. Your faith in Jesus results in good works for Jesus. And so we'll see that same idea again 
in chapter 3, and that's going to be our focus today. But boy, chapter 3, chapter 3 is the real deal. This chapter applies to the toddler who's just learning how to talk all the way to the oldest one in here. So we're going to read the whole chapter together. So follow along with me as we read James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, it's unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. When you read this chapter, maybe you recognize the same two things that I did. The way we use our tongues can be brutally destructive, so we desperately need wisdom from above. You know, you might have noticed that James starts off the chapter about communication by talking to teachers. It sort of seems like James just throws this in here out of the blue to start the chapter. But there's a reason he does this. Teachers need to keep this whole chapter especially in mind because they have a heightened place of influence among those they instruct. Students look up to their teachers. So a teacher ought to take special care to consider the words that they speak, not only because they influence others, but because God cares about your influence on others too. But if you're not in the classroom, or you're not teaching Sunday school, uh, you might think, okay, good, I'm, I'm, I'm out of this. I don't have to worry about James chapter 3. No, it's for everyone. This passage is for you too. And James begins verse 2 in a way that's a little ominous. He says, we all stumble in many ways. We all sin. And James says it happens often. And if you don't sin in the words that you say, you're perfect. And you're thinking, well, nobody's perfect. And while we should aim to defeat sin, we clearly know from our own lives and from the world around us that perfection in our words, that's pretty tough. And James aims to show us just how far away we are from using our words well. Our words, our communication, James uses the word tongue here, is powerful. The tongue influences, it shapes. It can be used for much good. It can also be used for much evil. 
So James starts off verses 3 through 6 by explaining that the tongue is powerful. He gives us some good illustrations, some good pictures of the power of our words, right? The small bit in the horse's mouth, the rudder that can move the, the giant ship, the spark that can burn down the whole forest. Personally, I think it's amazing that James had pictures that he wrote 2,000 years ago, and we still get every single one of them very easily. 2,000 years later, when we're talking about football and Twitter and Facebook, people will have no idea what we're talking about. But here, James picks something that we get perfectly. Each illustration gives us a little insight into the tongue. The bit in the horse's mouth controls the direction of the entire animal, right? With that bit, the rider, they can lead that horse fairly simply, if, you're a, if you know how to ride horses. Um, so we can easily understand that a controlled tongue leads the body well with, restra with restraint and, and discipline. And even though the verse doesn't say this, you can imagine the opposite, right? A wild horse, that's, that's uncontrollable. There's no directing something like that. So a person who speaks wildly, a person who speaks without, without discipline, they're set up to fail, aren't they? Perhaps you know someone who speaks like this. They speak with no filter, uh, with, with little thought. It reminds me of Proverbs 18.2. It says this, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. Restraint and discipline helps keep us in check with speech that's out of control. So we have the horse's bit, and then we have the, the rudder. James gives us another picture. He says, do you see the significance of what your words can do? Look at how those massive ships turn from just a small rudder. Your words might seem small. They might seem meaningless, but they can actually have immense effects. Imagine if I came home from work, and I told this to Melissa. I said, Melissa, I love you. It's a good start, right? You're an amazing wife. You're an incredible mom. You know how to mom, Melissa. So let me tell you what. Let me take care of dinner tonight. In fact, let me cook. I'll make my favorite tuna sandwiches. <laughs> and you enjoy some downtime tonight, Melissa, because I'll take care of everything. And so I'm going to guess that those words will, will alter the evening a little bit, maybe except for the tuna part. But I'm turning the ship in a different direction with my words. You know how I know that? Because most likely my response of I'll take care of the evening will be hugs and kisses from Melissa. Speaking good, kind, loving words to others, he build them up, encourages them, it gives them some joy. Even just a few thoughtful, encouraging words to someone can chart a course to a helpful place. You know, after the first two illustrations of the horse's bit and the, the rudder, you might be thinking, wow, my words can really make a difference. They're powerful. I could do a lot of good with my words. And you're right. You could. But James' last illustration isn't as pleasant. It shows that the tongue can be powerful in a harmful and destructive and a ruinous way way. There's a negative side to this. Look at the last part of verse 5 and then on to verse 6. James says how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. James he leaves the illustrations behind in verse 6, and he starts saying the tongue is this, that your communication is a fire. It is a world of unrighteousness. Your words can cause disaster. They can alter everything around you. LCC, your words, the words you say, they affect others. I remember when I was 19, Someone who I was close to spoke hurtful words to me. Words that were meant to cut and to sting. Words that they wanted me to feel. Have you ever experienced something like that before? Conversation that's meant to tear you down? 
hurtful words that you will always remember, nearly 20 years later, I still remember that conversation. Those words, they don't sting anymore, but they've left a mark. You know what the scary part is? We often remember the words that hurt us. But what if we have said the words that have done the hurting? You know, we don't easily remember those words that we say that hurt others. You know why that is? Because we attach reasons to why we said them. We think, well, they deserved it. Or, hey, they said mean things too. Or we respond, hey, I really didn't mean it like that. I was cranky that day, all right? We're often convinced that our cruel words aren't a big deal, but we forget that the Bible says that our communication can be like a forest fire. James is giving us a wake-up call. He wants us to understand the gravity of the situation. Your words are powerful. Realize what you say can affect others. Not only are your words powerful, but you're, they're also, they can be out of control. James brings another illustration that we can easily understand. We can, we can tame and train all sorts of animals. He mentions that in verses 7 and 8. My family was taking a walk in the neighborhood just a little while ago, and we saw a young lady outside in her front yard playing with her pet boa constrictor. And it was definitely longer than she was. It was green. <laughs> Um, and we sort of stopped and stared, and apparently they can make good pets, I think, but that's not on my Christmas list. <laughs> um, and James even mentions reptiles in, in these verses here. All sorts of animals can be trained, but that's not the same with the tongue. You see how he described it in verses 7 and 8? It's, it's evil, he says. It's full of poison. No human can train it or tame it. But we get this, don't we? We've all had times in our lives where as soon as we've said something, as soon as those words have left our lips, we wish we had them back, right? We think, oh no, why on earth did I say that? You play the conversation in your head and you're like, oh, why did I let that slip out? It's because our words are often out of control. You know, I didn't catch this until I studied the passage this week, but usually when I read these verses in James 3, by this point, I'm starting to feel a little hopeless. I, I know how I speak. How can I ever get a handle on the words that I say? But James, in verse 8, he leaves the door cracked open just a little bit for us to see that there might be an answer to this. He says that no human being can tame the tongue. Maybe we need more than human strength. Maybe Jesus can solve this. But James doesn't give us the answer quite yet. Because James isn't done explaining how sinfully we often speak. In verses 9 through 12, we see the tongue is it's hypocritical. I feel like verse 9 in James 3 reveals an excruciating truth about our communication. Look at verse number 9 with me. Let me find it. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, the tongue, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. We can bless God. We can praise God's name. In fact, we've done that today, haven't we? We've gathered together, and we've praised Jesus this morning. And, you know, if you think about it, even in the hour before in Sunday school, we, we gathered around tables, and we, we talked through Scripture. We discussed it together. Those are, those are good things, right? That, that's awesome stuff. In fact, using your words that way might be the most wonderful way you can express communication to give glory to God the Father. And, and ascribe him praises and build him up, giving praise to the creator God. But James says that those same mouths that were busy praising God, well, they were talking behind someone's back in the church parking lot after the service. They were mocking somebody else on the car ride home. They were ridiculing another during Sunday lunch tearing down and cursing the very ones made in the likeness of God, just like we are. And perhaps that's one of the worst things we could do with our words. We're skilled in, in double talk. You know, when I came to this, into this verse 12, I felt like we should hang our heads because we know it's true. 
And then I hope we're thinking like James in verse 10, he's saying, no, 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 this can't be the way it's supposed to be. This is not the way it's supposed to go. From the same mouth, blessings and curses, that can't be. It can't be the way to do it, Christians. You know, we ought to have a little righteous anger that this kind of talk is normal. Mocking and insulting, abusive, hurtful, rude language. That happens all the time. You see it in your workplace. You see it when it's typed out online. You hear it on the television. It's in our homes too. And James says you're even going to hear it when you're gathered together to worship God. This cannot be the way. And it's at this point in the passage, I want some help. And I'm thankful James doesn't leave us hanging. There's good news. So what's our response? We need wisdom from above. This is so good, LCC. Verses 13 through 18 show us the way. This is where our help comes from. It comes from above. We need the wisdom from heaven to conquer a tongue that's out of control. Look at verse number 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, and partial and sincere. As you look over these qualities in verse 17, it mirrors the life of our Savior Jesus. Holding on to this type of wisdom from heaven, this is someone who's walking after God. Christian, if you're displaying this type of wisdom, then this is Jesus doing a good work in your heart as you follow after him. You know, the good news of the gospel, it slips into James 3. How do you follow Jesus then? Well, you leave your old ways of sin behind, repent of them, and you believe by faith that Jesus is your Savior. Because James shows us what our words look like when God isn't in the picture. They're evil and they're, they're vile. They're, they're destructive. They're out of control. But words spoken from someone who's bent on following Jesus, verse 17 tells us they're pure and peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, sincere. When I read verse 17, it, it seems like a huge breath of fresh air from reading the first half of James 3. I want that kind of wisdom in my life. I hope you do too. You know, when you meet people who display verse 17, ones that use words that are honest and, and trustworthy and gentle, words that are honorable, when you meet people like that, do you know what you tend to do? I know what I tend to do. I, I want to sort of hear more from them. I like listening to them talk. These are people from um, that, that, that know how to give you advice and good counsel because they're sharing wisdom from above. You know, there are people at LCC that immediately come to my mind that fit this description of wisdom. I'm thankful for that. You know, I hope that you see that we need God's help on how we speak because we do a lot of it. I was looking up some statistics on how much communication we actually do. Get some of this. The average person sends 72 text messages a day. That number goes up the younger you are. It's estimated the world sends 23 billion text messages a day. The average person interacts and talks with 16 people a day. Some are more if you're working or in school. But over the course of a lifetime, researchers estimate that each person will meet and interact with 80,000 different people. The average person speaks around 16,000 words a day. The talkative ones can top out over 20,000. Maybe you know some of those 20,000 word people. Uh, I saw some elbows nudging there. Uh, that was interesting. <laughs> Men, on average, speak a little less. Women, a little more. But it's actually not that much of a difference, on average. That means most of us will speak hundreds of millions of words in our lifetime. That's an incredible level of communication. Do you see the need for God's wisdom to oversee hundreds of millions of words? We communicate a lot. 
And so whether you're an introvert, says there ain't no way, George, I'm getting to 16,000 words a day. <laughs> or an extrovert that's already gotten to that 16,000 by Sunday morning. Communication happens all the time. And we all need God's wisdom on how to do it. But you know, I probably already told you things that you know. You know the tongue is powerful. You know the tongue is hard to rein in. It's out of control. You know the tongue gives much double speak. It's hypocritical. But why is that? Why do we often so struggle with our words? You know, the Bible records a simple statement from Jesus in a couple different Gospels that's embedded into a conversation. It's one of the most insightful, helpful things ever said on communication. Draper's going to put it on the screen here. It's Matthew 12, 34. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. This is the secret, LCC, of how to control your words. We say what's reflected already in our hearts. In fact, somebody said it like this. Our conversations are like a thermometer for our heart. You know, our, our uh, thermometer measures your body temperature, right? To detect whether, you're, whether or not you're sick. In a similar way, our words, our manner of speech, are often a measure of our heart's temperature. So what does this mean? If you follow me around and listen to me talk for a day, you'd probably hear me talk about a few different things. You'd probably hear me talk about football eventually. I like football. And with the way my team is playing, you'd most likely hear frustrated words. <laughs> You'd probably hear me talking to my kids and having conversations with Melissa. My family's dear to me. You'd probably hear me talking about church. I care about the church. You're going to hear me talk about it. Those things, along with others, if you followed me around for a day, you'd say, that's what's on George's heart. And I would imagine that if I followed you around listening into all your conversations for a day, I would find out what's important to you as well. So that means... If you speak angry words, those words are a thermometer for what's going on in your heart. There's anger in your heart. If you speak words that demand and dominate, you might believe you're better than others. When you say something hurtful to someone and you respond, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I really didn't mean it. Actually, you probably did mean it. By the time those words came out of your mouth, your heart's already been there. Your heart's already dwelled on it. So God wants your heart to follow after him. And our words indicate who we follow. Your words show where you really belong. So controlling the tongue means having a heart that loves the things of Jesus and wants wisdom from above. Because we have to control our tongue. Every relationship you have in life will be shaped and affected for good or for evil by how you communicate. Isn't that interesting? You will change each relationship around you that's involved in your life by how you communicate. I think there are things that we need from God. We need to beg God to help us control our tongues for good. So here are three, as we close, three helpful practical pieces of application for us to land this plane on how we can control our tongues with hearts that seek wisdom from above. Here's the first thing. Number one, listen. This is straight James 1. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. But you know, you might be thinking, okay, listening is just being quiet. That's not all of it. Listening is being ready and interested to hear what the other person has to say. That's a level up, isn't it? Because you know what? We all zone out during a sermon, right? Yeah. Well, even I've done that. Not at LCC, of course. No, no. Um, but zoning out isn't listening. You're present, yes, but you're not ready and interested to hear what is being said. For some of us, we need God's help to, to hear what other people are saying to us. You want to have a controlled tongue? Be quick to listen. Listen to what your spouse is saying to you. Listen to what your boss says. There are people in your life that often make you angry. You know, when they talk, you know, oh no, I'm going to disagree with this person right away. Listen to the person even when you struggle to care for them. Proverbs 18.13 says, if 
One gives an answer before he hears. It is his folly and his shame. We would escape a world of trouble in this life and make God so much more beautiful to others if we would be quick to listen and slow to speak. Number two is this. Be patient. A controlled tongue listens and a controlled tongue is patient. You know what happens? When the, uh, when the annoyance level goes up with someone, so does the temptation to let your tongue go loose, right? It sort of rises with your annoyance. Be careful. Rather than engaging the one who is irritating you with a reply that you would know it crushed them and put them exactly in their place, pray that God would help you display patience. Ephesians 4, 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bear with another in love. When we love one another, our patience will grow. Why do we do this? Why be so patient? Because God's been patient with us, right? Think of God forgiving and forbearing with us. He's forgiven us of much. And the third thing, seek to understand. Controlled tongue aims to understand before responding. One thing is that I've observed is that we speak far too quickly and center on the one word or phrase that we know the other person's got wrong, and we zero on, in on that rather than trying to understand what the person is trying to say. We're trying to win the argument instead of trying to understand each other. That's not godly. That's selfish. So ask questions to make sure you understand completely what the other person is saying. When you're in conflict, try to grasp what the other person is trying to, to speak to you. It's even helpful to repeat back what they're trying to say. So you say, so to make sure I understand, are you saying this? Is that correct? Aim to understand the other person. Titus 3, 2 says, Speak evil of no one to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy. Wow. Toward all people. Attempting to gently understand the person you're talking to is exercising biblical wisdom. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. We need to realize, LCC, that our speech carries weight. We speak thousands of words a day, and we easily grow use, used to our own talk. We might grow callous to what we're actually saying, but the Bible says your words are actually can be part of your good works. What you say is living out your faith. Your speech can be part of your being a doer of the word. One more verse to show you, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that may give grace to those who hear. What's your calling here according to this verse? It's using fitting, timely words that build up so others can receive grace. It's good for us to pause and examine the words that we say to our parents or our children, to the ones that are important in our life, and then we need to go a little level deeper, right? What's in my heart? Am I seeking wisdom from above? What am I holding close? Is it the wisdom from above or is it hurtful, destructive thoughts? You know, I've done a lot of talking today. And you're going to talk today too. So it's my prayer for me and for you that our words are loving and kind and humble and gentle because our hearts are eager to have wisdom that's loving and kind and pure and full of mercy. We really need God's help on this. We've got to call out to God and ask him to change our hearts so we'd be filled with good, loving words to say to each other. So let's pray and ask God to help us. When I get done praying, let's have about 30 seconds. We can all talk to God about our communication with him. Let's pray. Dear God, we need your help on how we're supposed to speak. God, it's too much for human strength. Our speech, our words, if we think back over our lives, if we look back over these past few days, maybe some of our words have not been helpful. They've been hurtful. 
Maybe some of her words have been demanding. Maybe some of her words were meant to shame. God, maybe some of her words were aimed with hate. God, I pray that you would do good now to our hearts. Would you help us? God, maybe some in here need to repent. God, say, I don't I want to leave that way of speaking behind. I need your wisdom from above in my heart. God, all of us, we need to examine ourselves and pray for wisdom. And God, some in here need to start following Jesus. Say, I want the Jesus that shows me the way to live this way. I want that. God, would you use your Holy Spirit to open hearts that they would see that they desperately need Jesus? Would you call more to yourself? Would you grow your family even today? As a church family, let's take a few moments here and ask God for help on our communication. from above. In Jesus' name.